So far, Nikki, go ahead, just clap it up right quick. Get some great knowledge, get some great information. Sorry if my energy's a little off. I got some of that great, amazing vegan food, and I got the itis, man. <laughs> I might be posted up there, you know what I'm saying, taking a nap. But, you know, don't worry about that. No, but seriously, I want to introduce someone who's a, a pillar and an amazing person in this community that wants to go ahead and give you an official welcome and also bring on our next uh, speaker. Please give it up for Chandra Diller, please. Representative Chandra Diller. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know those who stay at, to the end get the best reward, don't you know? All right. Well, and I love this energy, uh, even at this hour. Um, I was uh, slated earlier to give you a welcome, but I hope by now that you really do feel welcome, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm Chandra Dillard, uh, state representative for House District 23. This lovely space that we are in is in the district, and so um, I'm pleased that everyone uh, found some time on your schedule to come out and get educated, right? Because when you know better, we're supposed to do better. That's right. And I am including myself in that. And um, we are thankful, I am thankful, that we have someone like Don Hilton Williams who uh, had the vision several years ago to bring us together under this umbrella to take care of her community, basically. And I will say this, that when the pandemic hit, I mean, really hit, and we were all behind closed doors, you guys remember that? It hadn't been that long ago. The first text I believe I got was from Dawn, and basically, she didn't say it like this, but I'm gonna paraphrase, she said, I told y'all, I told you so. Because what, what, what happened? It was an awakening. Something we knew and some of our communities knew about health disparity, chronic disease, but it was all about food insecurity and what we need to be doing to take care of ourselves and have access to help. So Don politely texted a lot of us and said, see, I told you so. And so uh, I am thankful for her. Uh, to not just sit on the sidelines and say, I told you so, but I'm telling you what to do about the challenges or the opportunities, because we saw a lot of opportunities out there with vendors to be able to live uh, in a more wholesome, uh, healthy way. And so Don, with that, I have a little gift for you. Right. Come on up. <laughs> it's just a little something to say how much I certainly appreciate oh. you. And um, she she left us here in Greenville, but she's not too far away, mm -hmm. two hours up. But when you're cooking that that good food with flavor, with flavor, flavor, <laughs> flavor, <laughs> just think about your home in South Carolina. I will. I won't forget and your friends here. Mm, I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> now, she's got, now she's got to pull herself together. All right. So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next um, speaker, which is Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He is a board-certified cardiologist and car cardiac electrophysiologist. And Dr. Baxter uh, Montgomery has spent uh, many years um, with medical practice in nutritional health and is a clinical assistant professor of medicine in the division of cardiology at the University of Texas in Houston, a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the founder and president of the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Health Center, formerly Houston Cardiac Association. Um, and I got the opportunity to spend some time with Dr. Montgomery in the green room, and I can tell you that he is concerned about his patient's whole wellness, 
And so in his center, that is in his team, uh, the center that he started in 1997 with the mission to reverse and prevent life-threatening illnesses in a holistic fashion. And so the center is located in Houston, Texas. The Montgomery Heart and Wellness Health Center is a state-of-the-art wellness facility complete with all the technology and resources to provide comprehensive medical and wellness care. Combining his medical practice with a food-driven lifestyle intervention, Dr. Montgomery introduces patients to a novel food prescription intervention that helps reverse chronic conditions such as heart disease, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, while minimizing or eliminating the need for medications or surgeries. Dr. Montgomery and his MHW Heart and Wellness team have refined this process over years with profound positive resource results in severely ill patients with many complex illnesses at the world-renowned Texas Medical Center. He is an author of the Food Prescription for Better Health, a comprehensive guide for reversing chronic illnesses. Dr. Montgomery also earned his undergraduate degree from Rice University in Houston and his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Baxter Montgomery. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for that wonderful uh, uh, introduction. And I'm going to jump right into my presentation. But actually, before I jump into the presentation, I'm going to uh, reminisce a little bit. I think this is the 20th anniversary uh, of my mother dying, actually, be October of this year. And that's not an anniversary you typically celebrate. But um, this topic that I'm going to share with you, the, the topic nutrition, uh, acute medical intervention, could probably be titled What My Mother Taught Me on the Deathbed. It's 20 years my mother died, and, and I'm going to go through the details. I go through it in my book. But the long story short, uh, when I was a kid, she'd say, I'm going to be the mother, your mother, until the day I die. And it was on her deathbed that she taught me the most important lesson I'll ever learn in medicine. And I'm going to share with you some of the insights that I gained with, from her on her deathbed while caring for her. So we're going to look at use of nutrition as an acute intervention. Now, think, we normally think of food, uh, eating healthy, lifestyles in general, as something we do today in hopes that something will happen beneficial later, prevent something long term. Eat some broccoli today, and in 20 years, something good might happen. But what about the patient who's acutely ill? What about the patient who drops dead and sudden death, gets resuscitated, gets in the hospital? What about the patient who's in the throes of a heart attack? The patient is a congested heart failure in the ICU, perhaps even on life support. Can nutrition help that patient? Can that nutrition make a difference at that point and that time? Well, we're going to find out. So I'm going to do a couple of things here. I'm going to examine the definition of chronic illness, both acute uh, and chronic and stable. And I'm going to talk about what underscores chronic disease. And I'm going to go through some technical sides. So in warning number one, we're going to get technical for a little bit. So the first part, we're going to talk about a little biochemistry and the like. And then we're going to, but, but there's a method, there's a reason for that, because I want you to understand what disease starts at. We have labels like heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, but what are these diseases really? So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go into some case scenarios. We've got three patients I'm going to talk about. That's warning number two. I'm going to get into some technical aspects of what we deal with patients in the hospital. But bear with me, I'm going to walk you through it because that's going to be a message because I want each one of you to walk away with some practical information as to what you can do if a loved one of yours is in the hospital and what you can do to make a life or death decision for that loved one. So let's jump right into it. So what is a chronic disease? Uh, we all know what it is. Basically, it's a condition that is an adverse condition of the body, affects one or more organs, that's expected to last more than a year. And, you know, we know them as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, et cetera. But these are just titles. 
you know, what is heart disease, what is diabetes? We have official definitions in medicine. Uh, you know, diabetes, hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.7 or whatever the case is, but why not 6.2? I mean, so the, the definitions or titles rather are arbitrary in nature. But these diseases have an underlying process, and that's what's important. When I manage patients, I teach my mid-levels, how do you manage diseases? You don't manage based on a label. You manage based on understanding what's the underlying process, because everybody with heart failure coming into the hospital does not necessarily have the same aspect of the underlying process, and we may have to manage it a little bit differently. So we want to understand mechanisms. So this, when somebody comes in, yeah, I look at the labels because I can communicate with the patient or the docs as to what's going on. But I'm thinking about the mechanisms as to what's going on with that patient so I can adjust medication accordingly, put them on nutrition accordingly, et cetera. So what are some mechanisms we need to think about? You hear a lot about inflammation, and that's important because inflammation is one of the key mechanisms that underscores all of these chronic illnesses. We know about arthritis and, and the like, because if anybody's ever banged up the knee or fallen or scraped, you have swelling and pain, so we know something about inflammation acutely. But inflammation under, it goes on inside of our bodies on a regular basis. It underscores cancer, neurological diseases, pulmonary diseases, bone joint diseases. Virtually every chronic disease has a, a component of inflammation. So that's an important aspect of, of uh, chronic illnesses. But how about oxidative stress? What is oxidative stress? Well, like inflammation is a, is a biochemical fire, oxidative stress is like a toxic chemical buildup. So you have toxic chemical buildup that can cause a cell to go from normal to a degenerated cell, pretty much like if you take an apple, you bite into it, you see it turn brown, that's oxidation. And we know from a chemical standpoint, you have molecules called free radicals that need an electron and they get an electron donation and they become stable. Uh, so antioxidants are what are called electron donors. So we eat it toxic foods like dead animal flesh and preservative foods and chemicalized foods and things with other toxic chemicals we build our body up with toxic free radicals. These free radicals, they flow around, and if they're not stabilized by antioxidants, they flow around and cause damage, damage to the heart, damage to the kidney, damage to our blood vessels. And so if, they're not, if they go unchecked, then they cause damage. So if we consume antioxidants, they stabilize these free radicals. So then you see, number one, the mechanism by which, you know what, broccoli and kale can help you out. It has a stabilizing effect of these toxic things that build up in our system. And it's not only the bad foods we eat. We build up free radicals with exercise and emotional stress, the lack of sleep and the like. So this oxidative stress is another important component. There's a third one that I could talk about that I don't mention, I'll just mention briefly, is an abnormal microbiome. You know, our body has more bacteria and other organisms than we have native cells. And our microbiome, a healthy microbiome, is an important component to a healthy body. An abnormal microbiome contributes to oxidative stress and contributes to inflammation. So the technical aspect of this is that we need normal biochemistry so that our body does not succumb to chronic illness. Now, here's warning number one. You're going to get a little bit more technical. Now, how does inflammation affect the heart? So if somebody has a heart attack, has heart failure, how does it affect the heart? So we're going to talk about inflammation as it affects the heart muscle itself. Inflammation contributes to pathogenesis and progression of heart failure through several mechanisms. There are pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, you may not have heard of cytokines, or may have heard of cytokine storms. Everybody then listened to all the news on COVID, and you know, the patient went into cytokine storm, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's nothing uh, unique to COVID. There are certain cytokines, you have IL, beta, uh, one beta, TNF, alpha, there are many others that, that are important, but the names aren't so important. It's just that these cytokines are molecules that are sent out by special cells when there's some damage. When there's damage or repair going on inside the body, they send these chemical signals out for other inflammatory cells to come. So it's almost like a, a, a fire. So we get a little fire here, and a fire alarm goes out, and the fire gets bigger. You fire two fire trucks, three fire trucks, et cetera. And if it's an exaggerated call for fire trucks, you get about 20 fire trucks and they come and tear the whole building down, try to put out one fire. But it may be an exaggerated response. And so these inflammatory uh, com uh, conditions are like an exaggerated response to minimal injury. So what happens is that we go into what's called a cytokine storm of the cardiovascular system when somebody goes into decompensated heart failure. 
How about the blood vessels? The endothelium is the lining, like the carpet on this floor, is the lining inside the blood vessels. So they could become inflamed. These endothelial cells are really important. They produce a molecule called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is important for the health of the blood vessels in general. But if the nitric oxide is not produced in normal uh, uh, situations, uh, well, it's not produced normally in situations of inflammation, several things happen. Number one, you get what's called stiffening of the heart, the cytoskeleton uh, uh, product, uh, component of the heart muscle gets, uh, 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 becomes dysfunctional, and you get stiffening of the heart. You also get thickening and, and stiffening of the heart due to hypertrophy or thickening of the muscle cells. Uh, the next thing that happens with endothelial dysfunction, you have other types of molecules like VCAM and E-selectin, and they result in collagen deposition, fibrosis, which is scarring. They cause the small blood vessels to dilate and stiffen and cause mild fibroblasts to promote more scarring and cause thickening and poor capillary function. In summary, scarring, poor blood flow to the heart muscle you get a heart muscle that's stiff, and it's not able to relax and not able to circulate blood adequately in this setting of inflammation of the blood vessels. And uh, it can also lead to heart attacks. The immune system plays a role in this. Uh, so you have an overactive immune system, leads to other inflammatory components, these uh, signaling molecules, TLR4, uh, the other signaling molecules that say that, oh, these cells are in danger, these cells are sick, and it causes more inflammation, more scarring, and more de destruction at the cellular level in the heart blood vessels and also the heart muscle itself. Now, what about oxidative stress? Well, there are four components of oxidative stress I'd like to talk about. Uh, first and foremost, again, oxidative stress, these abnormal toxic molecules, they can contribute to electrical abnormalities in the heart. Well, I'm an electrophysiologist. Why, I, why do I care about electrical abnormalities? Well, people die suddenly. Sudden cardiac arrest is the number one cause of death. And so if you have electrical abnormalities of the heart, you can have ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, the number one cause of stroke is atrial fibrillation. So if you have abnormal increased toxic molecules, they cause an increased influx of calcium inside the cells. And so this increase of influx of calcium results in abnormal uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum function, and it leads to things like atrial fibrillation, in some cases, and ventricular arrhythmias. Now, I want you to put a pin in that because we frequently give patients medications, antiarrhythmic drugs, for drug atrial fibrillation. If anybody knows a relative with atrial fibrillation, they're probably on a beta block or an antiarrhythmic drug, plus they're on a blood thinner. Why? We're trying to prevent stroke. Also, if somebody has an arrhythmia problem, you may have a defibrillator in it, especially if you have heart failure. So these are things that we're treating with medication and devices. The next issue is increase in calcium inside the cells causing what we call contractile dysfunction. In other words, weakening and stiffening of the heart. So you have, again, two biochemical processes leading to increased intracellular calcium, leading to abnormal arrhythmias, leading to a weak or stiff heart. The next thing we have, mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy uh, uh, currency, of a, they create the energy currency for the cell. So if you have abnormal mitochondria activity or ischemia to the mitochondria, you have energy metabolism dysfunction. So the heart cells are weak, and if the heart cells are weak, then the heart itself is weak, leading to things like congestive heart failure. And then you have an increase in reactive oxygen species, which causes more scarring, i.e. fibrosis. So in summary, number one, electrical abnormalities of the heart, number two, contractile dysfunction, weakening and stiffening of the heart. Number three, mitochondrial dysfunction or further weakening at the cellular level. And four, fibrosis. I want you to keep these mechanisms, put a pin in them, because when I start talking about the clinical patients, like I say, we want to treat patients, what? With mechanisms. So as I go through the management of these patients, we understand the mechanism that's happening that's causing these problems with these patients. So plant-based nutrition and general plan, I'm not going to talk about this too much. I want to know that, let you know that there's long-term data showing that patients with heart disease benefit uh, from a plant-based diet. This is an abstract showing that uh, they've done studies with low-carb diets, okay? So both groups have low-carbohydrate diets, one plant-based, low-carbohydrate 
carbohydrate diet. The other group, low carbohydrate diet that's animal-based, and the animal-based low-carb diet did worse at a higher mortality and an overall worse outcome. So we know that over the long period of time, patients who have heart disease, surviving heart attacks, do better on a plant-based diet. But the question that we're trying to address today, what about the acutely ill? And so we're going to look at this uh, with our first case series. So case one, it's probably the more complex of the case I'm going to go through. Uh, this is a patient, a 60-year-old man, who we've been treating. He had a condition of congestive heart failure. Uh, we call it non-ischemic, meaning that wasn't likely due to a heart attack or block uh, coronary arteries. He had a history of blood clots, pulmonary emboli, a history of blood uh, venous uh, thrombosis in the leg. And we had suspected, suspected that he had uh, amyloidosis at the time of this evaluation, but we had not confirmed it at the time. Uh, in fact, he does have amyloidosis, but that's not so critical to what I'm going to present at this time. So he came to us after being seeing us for a while. We had him on a plant-based diet. My PA was seeing him. Uh, but he started having several months of intermittent claudication, uh, and that's pain that got worse with exercise uh, in the left leg, uh, worse so in the right. Uh, and over the past uh, week prior to seeing us in the office this day, it became extremely uh, worse, and so we decided to evaluate him. Uh, and we did an echocardiogram. We also did Doppler studies on his leg. Now here I'm going to play with some of the technology and see if I'm successful. Now before I start the camera, this is a heart. Uh, this is the left ventricle. It's the main pumping chamber. The right ventricle there. The aortic. Uh, this is a fire chamber view. The aortic uh, root here and the aortic valve sits right about here. The mitral valve sits about here. Left atrium and the right atrium is kind of up here, hidden here. So. I'm going to get this moving now. Watch and see. I want you to focus on this part here and see how much squeeze you see in this heart. I'm going to go. It's not going to let me pause it, but that's okay. Notice that left ventricle, it was barely moving. It was thick, but it was kind of barely moving. And so this is congestive heart failure, systolic heart failure. The heart is very thick and it's also very stiff. Uh, uh, we have an echo tech student here and he'll probably recognize this as being restrictive diastolic dysfunction. I'm not gonna bore the rest of you with that uh, nuance there, but I just had a conversation with the echo tech. I thought I'd mention that to him in the audience. But anyway, so later on he presented with, uh, we did a Doppler study, found he had no flow in the artery on his left no pulse right away. Now that's an emergency because that's a risk of limb loss. You go in, you have a cold foot, no pulse. Uh, we had been adjusting his medication. He was in a, a, a tachycardia, uh, but we had to admit him to the hospital. Uh, so he was admitted to the hospital, heart rate in the low 100s. They did another Doppler, confirmed there was no Doppler pulse on the left. He has some uh, renal dysfunction, one, creatinine is 1.6, up from his baseline a year ago, potassium a little bit low, et cetera. So here's an acutely ill patient. We put him in the uh, IMU, start him on intravenous heparin, so standard of care. When somebody has a blocked artery, he's threatened flow to the, the leg. So, and we, I got my colleague to go into a peripheral angiogram, and uh, he saw that he had multiple acute blood clots to the left uh, superficial femoral artery. And so we called the surgeons, and we made a decision that it wasn't a good case to try to do percutaneous thrombectomy, which you can sometimes do, but it was so much clot formation, he thought it'd be best with him being so young, take him to the OR, take it out surgically. And that's what they did. The very next day, went to surgery, had a, a, a left femoral thrombectomy, uh, but they also saw some va vascular problems. They did a vascular bypass in the lower extremity. Uh, all that was done emergently. Now, let me pause right here because this is not a trivial matter. This is a patient that had an ejection fracture of about 20% or less, okay? He had an acute thrombosis. This is the highest risk patient to go for surgery, and this is the highest risk surgery to have in the OR. When I get patients that get screened for surgery, I look for, okay, what's your ejection fracture? What's your functional status? And we say, okay, uh, no, let's hold off on surgery until we get things better. No, we didn't have that option here. He was going to lose the leg, but he didn't go. So we had to go threaten his life to try to save his leg. So anyway, 
Uh, so he went to surgery, got through it, lost quite a bit of blood, he got a unit uh, of blood uh, prescribed. Uh, his creatinine was a little bit uh, borderline, so it's getting a little bit worse. Uh, we got a nephrology consult. Uh, he got the pulse back, but then lost it uh, a little bit. And I'm going to kind of walk you through this, because I know it's a busy bullet point. But the point is that right after surgery, things a little bit helped the skelter. So he lost, got gain flow back. I've had the bypass, but then he lost flow temporarily. They had to do a CT angiogram. Now, those of you in the medical field know that we give contrast for a CT angiogram. And you get a contrast, somebody with weak kidneys is not a good thing. This guy had weak kidneys. But we had to do this emergency because, hey, he lost his pulse, want to see what's going on, and may have to take him back. So we did something that threatened yet another organ. Okay? So you had to do a CT angiogram. So, but that showed the flow uh, to be okay. The doppable pulse came back. Uh, he was having pain in the leg. We controlled that with medications. Uh, he had to get, uh, he got one unit of packed red blood cells. His hemoglobin had dropped which again threatened circulation. So again, the next day, uh, in summary, uh, the lactic acid was going up. Increased acid buildup is a sign that you're not circulating peripherally, okay? If you're not getting circulation to your muscles, you build up lactic acid. So this is the thing that was shown up in him. So as we went through this problem, this was starting to become a mess. He had to get more blood, heart was getting worse, he was in this fast heart rate arrhythmia. And so what did we do? We started him on norepinephrine. Many of you in the medical field know that this is a medication to increase blood pressure. This is a medication you give somebody whose heart's failing, who's in cardiogenic shock. In this patient, who's in cardiogenic shock. So uh, one morning, Saturday morning, I went. His leg was swollen. He all of a sudden lost his pulse in that foot again and also lost nervous sensation. Leg, tight leg loss of nervous sensation, loss of pulse, that's compartment syndrome. That's another medical emergency. Guess what? Go back to the OR. And to go back to the OR and had to have it opened up, release the bleeding, release the tension, otherwise you'd lose the leg. In fact, the surgeon was saying, hey, you might lose your leg. The patient's upset about this. I know you're not gonna lose your leg. We got on top of this. So what did I do? My colleagues wanted to get the advanced heart failure team in. I said, no. You don't need advanced heart failure. I called my colleague, my electrophysiologist colleague, because the patient was in this abnormal heart rhythm, electrical flutter. Remember, we talked about earlier what causes electro abnormalities. This is a quiz. Inflow of calcium in the cells, oxidative stress. I heard somebody say that. Okay? Inflammation, oxidative stress, causing arrhythmias. He was in this persistent arrhythmia. Why? He was having a lot of oxidative stress. It was systemic. And he had to go to surgery, caused more oxidative stress. And so he had poor circulation, caused more inflammation, ischemia, and oxidative stress. So this arrhythmia was causing the heart failure to work uh, uh, harder and decrease the circulation. So I had to do one thing, say, colleague, get rid of this atrial flutter. So the next day we took him to the atrial flutter. This is after he had the hematoma relief and relief for the compartment syndrome. So he went to the uh, cath lab and had the ablation for his atrial flutter. Make note of this date, 1126. Now, I had started him on his detox the day before, but the nephrologist was fighting me on it. Uh, I brought him uh, raw coconut water. We got him green uh, juices in there, all raw vegetables, all green raw smoothies. I said, you need to detox. We need to detox now. The other doctors get in the hospital, get some confusion. I said, nope, I'm the attending. I'm the boss. You shut up. <laughs> so anyway... Some of those cardiologists have bad egos. I'm, that's not me. That's not, that's not me. Anyway. Uh, point is, we had to start to detox right away. His creatinine was 4.58. Normal creatinine is 1. The higher the creatinine, the worse the kidney function. His GFR is around 12. This is near dialysis level. So we were on the threshold of needing to give him dialysis. I wasn't too worried about it, but we said, okay, let's hydrate. Let's get rid of the flutter. Let's improve the cardiac output. Let's detox, detox, detox. So anyway, we got some more uh, blood. Gave him a little diuretics around that. So this is the 27th. Ablation on the 26th. Uh, detox on the 27th. On the 29th, white blood was trending down. He had a little bit of uh, a ur a ur uh, a UTI, questionable UTI. EF was still very low. Uh, had a little bit of fluid effusion around the heart. 
But by then, this is two days after detox, three days after the ablation, he was doing better. And then on the fourth day, third and fourth day consecutively, respectively rather, he was doing much better. He was okay to get out of bed. Uh, we had held his beta blockers, his blood pressure a little bit tenuous, but his blood pressure is okay off medications. But he was stable enough to go to the IMUs. Here's someone who is nearly on death's bed, had to have two urgent surgeries, weak heart, but we did two key things, got his rhythm under control, hydrated him, three key things, hydrated him, but also detoxed him. And uh, on the first, he was able to get ready uh, and was doing much better, awake and alert, sitting up in bed, having good bowel movements. And by the 4th of uh, December, uh, he was appropriate for discharge. So, so what happened with this patient in summary? So the creatinine, as I said, he came in, his kidney function wasn't normal, but it got worse because we had to do some things to him. We had to take him to surgery emergency, which is a stress. We gave him contrast after the surgery, which is more stress on the kidneys, et cetera. And these are things we just had to do, the sick patient. But this little gold bar shows when we did the atrial flutter ablation, and this bar here shows when we started detox. And when we started these two key things, in my opinion, the kidney function started getting better, creatinine came down. The GFR, which went low, below 15 is where you start dialysis if they stay there. After we ablated his flutter and detoxed him, it got better. Uh, lactic acid level came down. We didn't get a lot of levels, but it came down back to normal. Uh, AST, liver congestion, improved. White blood count, which is a sign of inflammation did go up, it came down some, it remained abnormal because the patient did go out with a wound vac, he had an open wound, there was more work to be done, but he did, the inflammation did subside some, the albumin level was low, it was low due to the inflammation, notice it dropped before we started to detox diet, so don't blame it on the raw fruits and vegetables only. Uh, well, he was on a plant-based diet anyway, so it's 3.4, but the inflammation caused it to drop. Uh, and so, in summary, what was wrong with this patient? So reason for the patient decompensation. So I put bullet one, suboptimal plant-based nutritional regimen. Now, why do I say that? You know, this patient is very compliant, and he had done a detox before, he was on the plant-based, my PA was following him fairly closely. But, you know, she's not as mean and evil as I am. She allowed him to have some cooked foods. And, um, and it's nothing wrong with cooked foods, except if you're severely ill like this. Okay? When you have an extreme condition, you need to go to an extreme level of reversing that condition. And so I say it's a suboptimal plant-based diet. In fact, we're managing him now. He's on a raw detox diet with time-restricted eating. We're going to put him on smoothie feasts and, and water fasting, and we're going back and forth with infrared sauna, all that stuff, to reverse his conditions. He's on a much more aggressive regimen. Now, on the, the raw diet, it's not just... You know, that, that plate that Dr. Mills showed, just the lettuce and all that. We, we do do some days like that. But, uh, but we have savory raw food. There's, uh, I forget that vendor who's out there. She may not be here, but she served up some delicious sprouted wild rice. You can do some wonderful things with raw vegan food. I'll show you a few examples at the end. But he's on a lot of that. The atrial flutter, the arrhythmia, was abnormal, and that caused a problem. Uh, the uh, embolization to the artery, which sets off circulation, and the fact that he had to go for surgery immediately also was a problem. So it was a part of the solution, but it was also part of the problem. Uh, reason for recovery? Well, the surgery was part of the reason. Uh, the ablation of the arrhythmia and the nutritional detox was part and parcel in that, and I think it was the, the foundation of his recovery. Case two. Not as complex as case one, but does have a little twist and turns here. Six, six-year-old lady with heart failure, severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, keep that in mind. Interventricular conduction delay. Uh, and her heart failure was worsening. She was uh, having more shortness of breath. Uh, and we had to admit her to the hospital because she was decompensated. Now, uh, before I start this video, this is the left ventricle. This is the, the uh, left atrium here. Now, the right ventricle is way up here, but I want you to focus on this area right here. See how big this is? This is about one, this chamber is one and a half size, one and a half times the size of this chamber. A little bit of fluid around here. And it should be the other way around. Uh, I want you to notice this is going to be a big, I can't freeze it 
from here, but notice there's going to be a big mosaic colored thing that flows from here to here when I start this, okay? Next frame, watch it now. See that? You see that? Okay, you got one little flash there, uh, and, uh, and you see that, and it's going back the other way. And see the heart doesn't squeeze very much there. Anyway, the point is that a large, weak heart with too much blood going back to the left atrium, which then goes back to the lungs, which make you go shorter, make a shorter breath. So she had mitral valve regurgitation that was severe. Uh, it doesn't show the regurgitation as much here, but again, it shows that left atrium being very, very large uh, in this view here. So, hospital course. So the patient admitted to the hospital and started on intravenous diuretics to kind of get rid of the uh, shortness of breath to help out with the uh, pulmonary congestion. Uh, she had episodes of worsening the dysrhythmia. Now this patient had lupus. It was in the first slide. I didn't emphasize that. That's important because that's an inflammatory condition. It's a systemic inflammatory condition. Remember, these underlying diseases are all the same. Inflammation, oxidative stress. So she had systemic inflammation, which uh, predisposed to increasing oxidative stress. Oxidative stress caused what? Increased cell calcium in the cells, which predisposed to arrhythmias. She had atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. They worsened her heart failure. We had to put her in the CCU because of that. Okay, so she required being managed in the CCU. Uh, I had put her in to consult with my um, um, uh, structural heart uh, consultants, cardiology consultants, to, to evaluate her for mitral clips. So There's a technology you can use with a leaky mitral valve. You go in with a catheter, put it across the, the heart. Uh, across the septum, and you can clip the mitral valve and keep it from leaking so much. I said, well, maybe this will help her out. Uh, so uh, the structural heart team is consulted, divided mitral for mitral valve clipping, but they looked at her. Now, we had her in the CCU. We'd gotten her pretty well stable by the time we got him in because we had to, it took us several days to put on drips and things like that to get her rhythm under control. Uh, they said, no, she's too sick. They kind of looked at the chart and saw, well, you know, we, that's nothing we can do. Uh, my colleague uh, said, well, you know, probably just send it to palliative care. I talked to my EP consulting, and she had an interventricular conduction delay. I said, look, you know, why don't you put a bi VICD in for me? It'll synchronize the heart. Maybe that'll help out with the heart function. She looked at it, looked at the chart. Nah, too far gone. So we consulted uh, Dean 26, so we consulted the palliative care team uh, to evaluate her. And the paid care team said, let's just optimize on medications. We'll send it to uh, a hospice facility, an inpatient hospice facility. So these are the medications she was on. She had an over-the-counter vitamin C, a diuretic, furosemide. Hydroxychloroquine is for her uh, lupus. Uh, she was on a milrinone infusion. Milrinone is a medication we infuse for heart failure patients, kind of end-stage heart failure patients. It helps strengthen the heart, gives them a little bit of, uh, you know, breath and recovery. Uh, and then she was on patoprazole, and sotalol was for the arrhythmias. So it controls atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. So that was her regimen, and she was going to go out to hospice on this regimen. So the hospice said, okay, we can take care of her. However, we sent her out. The problem was the hospice, I don't know, there was a miscommunication somehow, but they said, we don't do milrinone drips. So when she got out, she was out for about 24 hours, maybe a little bit more, didn't get her milrinone. So she had to come back to the hospital a little bit decompensated because she had missed her melanone. So she came back in the hospital. So we found out that there are no hospice facilities that control melanone. So we called the um, um, palliative team. And so they said, well, too bad, so sad. Uh, we'll have to stop the melanone here and let you die here. And so I went to the CCU, the patient was there in the bed, and she said, you know, she was there. They told me I'm going to die, and I'm going to choose my last meal. I said, shut up, you're going to detox. <laughs> I, got, I got to work on my bedside manner, right? <laughs> no, that's true. That's what I said. It's nonsense. Stop crying. It, 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 it's a, I, I partially joke about it, but, but, but here's the point I want to emphasize. Your emotional status is really, really important because I want to emphasize this to all of you, whether you're in the bed or loved ones in the bed. I've seen this approach work at every level 
the exceptional one. We went out to the graveyard and sprinkled raw juice and nobody's gotten up. That's the only time it's been too late. <laughs> to the point of life support, et cetera. I had a patient, I'm not presenting that case here, but I had a patient on life support, ventilator all, heart filling, lungs filling, et cetera. We put green stuff through a peg tube. We detoxed her, she walked out of the hospital. It's not 100%, but the body has the ability to heal itself. But we have to get the mind right. And so when the patient's crying in the bed about my last meal, I don't want to hear that. I want you to focus on what you need to do, and you're not going to die. You're going to fight. We're going to get through this. And so, yeah, I am very stern, and I'm very to the point with them at the bedside because that's what they need. They don't need me crying on the shoulders with them. Okay? They need a swift kick in the rear end, and let's get to work. And that's what we did. So anyway, so... Talk to hospital manager, give me seven days. You know, Danny said, suffer me 10 days, and we just did, they only gave us seven, but that's okay. Uh, and the patient underwent successful detoxification weaning of the IV melanone in about seven days. What we did is we put on a smoothie feast. Most of the days she only had raw smoothies. We put super greens in it, we put blue green algae in it, uh, and there was some fruit in it, but kale, spinach, smoothies, all that. And she just drank smoothies all day. And we just progressively weaned the medications. Now, weaning the medications is extremely important. I told you this is the 20-year anniversary of my mother dying. And it was due to over-medications. Congestive hepatopathy is what heart failure patients with. So they have a liver failure related to heart failure congestion. For the medication we consume, many of them have to be metabolized through the liver. And so when you're on the detox, it's very, very important not only to wean the dead animal flesh and all the toxic foods, we got to wean the toxic medications. And that's what we did. So we were very aggressive in doing that. And so, um, so she was discharged home only on another diuretic called Bumex or Bumetanide, half a dose only as needed. And, and she only needed maybe very, very rarely. So her hospitalization was as follows. A little bit more complex in the labs. Kidney function started out, you know, uh, somewhat uh, uh, labile, improved. Now, this improved is due to our medication. I had on some melanone, some drugs, and it kind of bounced around. The arrhythmia made it worse, and it got a little bit better once it got the arrhythmia under control. So she went out on hospice on melanone here, but came back, and kidney function got a little bit worse because she was off the melanone at hospice. So we detoxed at this point, and it got better. Again, GFR. The higher the GFR, the better on our drugs. It got worse with the arrhythmia, got better after we got the arrhythmia under control on milanone. So discharge, decent shape uh, a GFR here, but she came back off the milanone. We start the detox here, and it got better. Uh, lactic acid level peaked up off the milanone. It got better after detox. Uh, and similarly here, the liver congestion didn't really get worse but it never, it stayed okay on detox. And same thing here with the ALT, less liver congestion. One little curious thing here on detox, white cell went up. That's a sign of increased inflammation. You can sometimes see a flare up when you detox. That's kind of people get these detox reacts the first few days, a week after, because your body's cleaning out things. So you can have an inflammatory flare early after detox, uh, but then that subsides uh, after. Uh, so the, the key thing is that when we initially discharged her, she was on about six medications. This is an over-the-counter vitamin C. I use vitamin C, but we use a high-quality vitamin C, but I didn't want her on the over-the-counter vitamin C, and that's why we stopped it. She went out on a Bumex only as needed, uh, essentially zero, because she really, I mean, we saw her like a week or two after, uh, and um, she... Uh, she wasn't really taking Bumex uh, much. So, so she went from six medications to one. Now, um, uh, one on a pure end basis. This was probably a key part to her improvement. Uh, the reason why she decompensated, she was on a suboptimal plant-based diet. She ate plant-based, but she ate too much processed. Again, plant-based, and I'm talking to people transitioning, when you're this sick, you know, this, you know, your cheat days are over. You know, you, you, you all use them all up. It's, it's detox from here on out. Uh, severe mitral valve insufficiency, atrial tachycardia, the arrhythmias, uh, conduction out of the mouth. Again, these things are all, 
Inflammation and oxidative stress contribute to mitral valve disease. She had a systemic inflammatory condition, which contributes to inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the valves, etc. She had uh, atrial arrhythmias. Again, when we talk about calcium influx in the cells and the myocytes, causing electrical abnormalities, uh, conduction abnormalities, systemic inflammatory flare of the lupus, which kind of put more fire on the flame. And so uh, the reasons for, for recovery was the detox and the medication. We, the detox is like putting the fire out. It's like okay, when we put those smoothies in our gut, it fed the gut, it detox the body. It's like we literally put a hose inside her biochemical system and just put that fire out. And it didn't take, you know, years. It took seven days. We didn't have years. Okay? The paid it to the team and the man said, get her out or let her die. You got seven days. Okay? So you've got to work fast. You've got to detox hard and do it immediately. Case three. This is a 76-year-old man, history of diabetes, stroke, you know, lower extremity, DVT, blood clots. Current, I mean, these are all the same disease. He's got different manifestations, same problems, okay? Bad fooditis, you can even, you know, sum it up that way. He was seen, uh, we did a chemical stress test uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and it showed some abnormalities, but he presented to an outside hospital with chest pain and some EKG abnormalities. He was found to have um, some changes in Fearley. Uh, another cardiology saw, cardiologist saw him uh, because of these EKG changes and, and appropriately gave him IV heparin and appropriately took him to the cath lab. So in the cath lab, uh, he saw diffuse multivessel coronary artery disease uh, and three major vessels had major stenosis. He felt this patient is not a candidate for angioplasty. He needs to go right to surgery. He called the surgeon, this is in the middle of the night, he called the surgeon at another hospital who's ready to take him. And I know, you know both of the cardiologists and surgeons, I've worked with both of them over the years. Uh, but the patient family called me, got through my answering service, said, look, we want to go to your hospital. Uh, after a few you know, calls and making uh, arrangements to transfer, we finally got him over to the Texas Medical Center. So I saw him with my surgical colleague. And we decided that um, initially it was referred for emergency surgery, uh, but cabbage, well, we, we felt that um, he would benefit from just IV heparin and observation, okay? Uh, we got our interventional colleague to see him. He said, well, he voted against uh, PCI, uh, same as the previous uh, cardiologist. But the patient had his own plans. <laughs> said, look, I'm out of here. And it's kind of hard to blame him, right? You go to one place, oh, you need surgery. Hold on, surgery. Come to the other place, oh, you don't need surgery. So y'all make up your mind. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go home while y'all figure out what you want to do. <laughs> Wasn't quite the right decision, but, you know, he, he, we, he was competent. And, uh, and so we sent him out, but unfortunately, he wasn't ready to go. Came back in worse condition. Uh, he was a little bit dehydrated, more chest pain, shorter breath. Uh, and so the surgeon definitely didn't want to touch him then, nor did the, the individual cardiologist. So here's a guy in the throes of a heart attack. In the throes of a heart attack. Too sick for surgery, too sick for PCI. What are we going to do? Detox. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the only thing left, right? <laughs> Otherwise, if you call the palliative team, you know what they're going to say. <laughs> here's your last meal. So it's cardiac troponin. These are the molecules you measure for a heart attack. These typically go up and come down, um, uh, as we see here. And so he had a typical recovery. I put the detox bars on two days. He started toward the end of this day and this day full day. Uh, but as he went through detox, the BNP, BNP is a B-natriated peptide, is a molecule that measures myocardial stress. Now, someone with a weak heart normally has a high BNP. So if you have norm somebody with a weak heart, that BNP should be high, which is abnormal for somebody with a normal heart, but it's normal for somebody with an abnormal heart because that, that means that they're, they're working at a higher volume pressure. And so, but if their BNP is lower, that means they're likely volume, de volume depleted or dehydrated. So he came in back in the hospital, BNP was 304, which is still high, but probably wasn't high enough for him. And he started eating all the raw stuff, it went up. And so even though that may, you may think that's worsening, it's actually him better because it means he was more hydrated. Uh, I should have put that slide this hour of the day, but nevertheless. Kidney function bounced around a little bit, got a little bit worse when he came back in. 
And it stayed worse, but it's still, you know, 0.9. Uh, didn't get too bad. Uh, he didn't have to go through any more corneal angiograms. Uh, and this is someone who had abnormal kidney function to start with, who did have a corneal angiogram, so his kidney was a little bit threatened by the contrast. GFR, again, improved a little bit before he went out. Lactic acid level went down significantly. This is the, probably the most important barometer because when he came back in the hospital, his heart was weaker, he was dehydrated, he wasn't perfusing very well. But once he got on the raw fruits and vegetables, one thing about the raw fruits and vegetables, we talk about all the minerals and nutrients, but one thing they have is water. You know, water is really important. And, 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 and plant-derived water is probably more hydrating than the water we get from, you know, water bottles. So the fact he's eating all raw fruits and vegetables uh, gave him plant-derived water. Inflammation went down and still remained a little bit elevated, in my opinion, but still it improved significantly uh, throughout the hospital course. Albumin dropped because of inflammation uh, in the setting of an acute uh, decompensated heart failure, but the congestion on the liver became less. And so overall, this patient's condition improved because, one, he's the, 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 the reason for his decompensation he was not on a, a, a plant-based diet. Now, he had a very supportive family, okay? His daughter, son-in-law would buy him meal plans. We have GK20 meal plans. They buy him the meal plans, and he'd sneak out and eat the bad food <laughs> while on the meal plan. So his stubbornness and noncompliance was on the list of why he decompensated uh, in addition to his other cardiac problems. But the reason he recovered, he was in the hospital. He was sick. And uh, he was able to comply at that time, nutritional detox, the bed rest health, the medication weaning. Again, always important. You know, um, when my patients are this sick and they're in dire straits, you know, on death door, on their last breath, I worry the least about them at that time. Because they say, okay, you need to detox. They say, oh, I'm with you. They're going to comply. It's when they're feeling better. When I, when I lose sleep is when they're feeling better. Because they, you know, they're feeling great, they're breathing well, they're energetic, and all of a sudden they want to go back to their old habits. And so that's when we have uh, trouble with them. In fact, of these three patients, only one of them is still alive. The lady I presented the second time, she did great for months. Now, we struggled and worked with her, and, but she would come into the office. Because she came in, she was compliant for like two and a half, three months. On the raw diet, predominantly, we gave her, you know, stuff from the garden kitchen. She was feeling great. We walked her outside. She was dancing. I mean, she was doing, I mean, she went from hospice to kind of dancing and walking. And we took her on the back of our building and walked her up, you know, stairs and things like that. I mean, she was functioning at a much higher level than she should have been. But then the next thing we knew, she was getting baked chicken with the family events and so on and so forth. And she was off to the races. And, and that was history. Similarly with the, the man. Uh, you know, maybe after a month, he got off of it. So the compliance, and we're doing other things I'll tell you about later uh, in terms of uh, how to help these patients stay on it. So what's, what's the data? We've actually published the, the, in the medical literature the effects of our food to look at the biochemistry. Now, when you look at the hemodynamics and anthropomorphic uh, effects of raw plant foods, you see the usual things. Uh, weight loss and BMI reduction, but white blood count comes down, and this is week to week, okay? These things happen significantly from week to week. Blood pressure is reduced. These are things that you expect. Heart rate goes down, et cetera. Uh, but what about heart failure patients? Well, we did a case series of patients. We had an MRI of the heart before and an MRI of the heart after on an average 78 days on a, a plant-based diet, mostly detox uh, diet. We saw the stroke volume go up. That's the amount of volume of blood that the heart contracts with each beat. The cardiac output, which is the total body circulation, uh, oops, excuse me, ejection fraction went up. The LV mass went down, okay? Ejection fraction is percentage of blood that gets squeezed with each beat. And they went from an ejection fraction on average of 22% to about 44%. This, they need a defibrillator. At this point, they don't need a defibrillator. So that's a pretty significant increase. Stroke volume, a baseline increase, that's the volume of blood that's uh, ejected with each beat, and cardiac output increase, which is the total body circulation uh, from baseline to final. So that's just an inf uh, the influence of food alone. Um, we looked at inflammatory markers, okay? 
uh, inflammation went down by 30%. This is just in four weeks, just the food alone. Uh, inflammatory cytokines, we talked about that before, was reduced significantly by 23%. The TNF alpha, we didn't see a significant change in four weeks. It probably takes longer. Um, plaque 2 is a vascular inflammatory marker, it goes down by 16%. Uh, white blood count goes down by 22%, and other inflammatory white cell uh, cells go down. So basically, inflammation, the fire's being put out. Now, these were not acutely ill patients. Okay, these were stable patients in the outpatient setting, but we show how much we're reducing oxidative stress, reducing inflammation in these patients. Uh, total cholesterol in these biomarkers go down significantly. Uh, an interesting thing here, the insulin resistance, Dr. The Mills did an excellent talk, uh, an excellent dissertation, I should say, on diabetes earlier today. And he says something quite interesting. He said the hemoglobin A1C, these patients, these were not diabetics, by the way. The recruitment criteria for these patients in this study were patients with uh, BMI, high BMI, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. That's the three criteria that they had to meet. So they didn't have to be diabetics. But on average, they were pre-diabetics. Average. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is 5.9. And so we measured hemoglobin A1C at baseline and four weeks later. Now, Dr. Mills told you that the hemoglobin A1C is an average of blood sugar over what period of time? Who's listening? Huh? Three to four months. So listen, right? Now, why would we measure hemoglobin A1C in one month for something that measures something over three? Why would I expect to see a change in one month? Well, in fact, we did see a change about 3.4%. And the other thing that influences hemoglobin A1C is fluctuating blood sugars, okay? There was another graph that Dr. Mills showed you in his dissertation that showed uh, the difference in blood sugars after patients ate on a what? High-fat diet versus low-fat diet, carbohydrates, low dead animal flesh, high dead animal flesh, low dead animal flesh. And the postprandial blood sugars go up when you're on the high fat, saturated fat or high dead animal flesh diet compared when you remove it. And my theory is, we haven't proven it yet, is that those postprandial blood sugars that go up contributes to wide swings in blood sugars. Every time you eat dead animal flesh, blood sugar up, 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 and down. So that increased the hemoglobin A1C also in addition to the average blood sugar, and I think that's what we're affecting here in the short period of time. And this 3.4% reduction in four weeks, and you have, if you take one of these diabetic drugs, it takes six months to a year to get half of this much of a reduction. And they're starting at hemoglobin A1C is much higher, so the body heals itself uh, much faster, uh, C-reactive protein as we showed before, uh, other future investigation, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, we have a study we have IRB approval for at this point. I'm collaborating with Georgia State University. We're going to look at patients with known coronary disease, and we're going to start looking at biochemical changes, genetic changes, uh, the change in epi uh, epigenetics, while at the same time following patients clinically. We can compare the defined raw plant-based diet to the Mediterranean diet, uh, and we're going to see how these changes happen clinically and biochemistry, biochemically. So for instance, if I see a decrease in arrhythmias, we're gonna, we're gonna be measuring the effects on the sarcoplasmic reticulum at the biochemical level in the very same group of patients. That's not been done before. You know, a lot of people have rat data and animal data, this, that, and the other, but we're gonna have human data in the same people's blood. It's gonna be looked at at both levels at the same time, the same intervention, and we're gonna do it over a period of six weeks because we don't think it takes that long. And we'll look at you know, things like blood pressure, echo, EKG, stress, uh, different blood measures. This is on the clinical side, LP little a, pulse score. They have a questionnaire. Then on the biochemical side, TNF alpha, IL-6, IL beta, one beta, nitric oxide, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna actually examine the food. We're gonna do a polyphenol analysis of the patient. We're gonna do, uh, look at the polyphenols in the blood pre and post prandially. We're also going to send the food. They're going to analyze the food uh, and say, okay, what's in the food of this diet versus this diet compared to what effects it has? Uh, we're going to look at monocytes and leukocyte isolation to then look at oxidative stress, look at endothelial nitric oxide. All those biochemical things we talked about in the theoretical sense, we're going to be looking at it in the clinical setting 
uh, and we're going to look at uh, the effects of the blood on human uh, cardiomyocytes. We're going to look at potentially effects on the blood of hypertrophy, uh, sarcoplasm reticulum stress, uh, peroxin, antioxidant. That's a lot of technical terms. The, 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 the summary is simply this. We're going to look at what's happening inside the cell and what's happening to the patient at the same time. And, and the important part about this is we're going to show that the food works at the biochemical level. When we do our drug studies and we do all these guidelines, we do not look at things at this level. To some extent, we look at some of the things. But for the most part, we we'll look at basic general indicators. They find enough of a change. They look at one therapy, one poor therapy versus another poor therapy. Okay? And the new poor therapy beats the old poor therapy. They say, okay, we'll use the Newport therapy. So it's sort of like a guy with, you know, you know, twisted ankle. Okay, a guy with a broken leg, rather. And you got another guy with a twisted ankle. So he races the guy with a broken leg. And he wins by, you know, a nose. And so the guy with the broken leg beats out. So that's the new therapy, the guy with the broken leg. That's our new medication we use. Neither are effective. Okay. It's just that one's a little bit better than the other, and you have a patent on the new one, so we use the new one. Okay? You all got it? Quick word about the food. It's not just grass and water. The nori rolls is uh, uh, sprouted wild rice. We got a beet burger here. This is made right in our garden kitchen. We, and a patient, the hospital is just four miles from our center, so we get the food to the center. The wife is coming and getting the food and all of that. Uh, we were making them uh, sprouted noodles, uh, and uh, this is our better than tuna sandwich here. That's good. We have a dehydrated bread and all of that. Uh, we use super greens and things in our smoothies and, and uh, E3 Live uh, superfood uh, in the smoothies as well. So final thoughts. Uh, the benefits of leading a healthy lifestyle are universally accepted. We pretty much know that. I mean, you know, everybody, even the person, you know, lays on the, 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 the most common couch potato knows I need to get up off the couch. They don't do it, but they know it. So we don't have to debate them on it. Uh, benefits of plant-based foods are generally universally accepted. Now, even people that push keto diet and paleo diet, those diets have plant foods. So even if we say, okay, Mr. Keto, Mr. Paleo, we give in, your foods are healthy, our diets are healthy, then all we do is back and say, you know what, but what's the common denominator of all the diets? Plant foods. You see? And so we all universally know, even if we don't know, you know, that plant, uh, the, the totally plant-based lifestyle is healthy, we know that plant foods are essential. Uh, and, uh, but we know that all, only plants are most essential. Application of health and nutritional lifestyle and clinical medicine needs more precision. We talk about this whole concept of food as medicine. And, and, and I say this to my colleagues and, and to really to all of us, we all need to be precise in the way we apply our foods. And a lot of us have talked, we had a conversation uh, uh, not long, I was talking to, to Don earlier, and we were talking about a lot of the processed vegan foods, things under the vegan label, and they sort of sneak things in. Uh, we need to be precise. Uh, and so we can't have over-chemicalized foods, et cetera. And so um, what foods to consume under what circumstances, from where should the food be procured, okay? Is a salad from a fast food restaurant as good as any other salad? You know, how do they treat their lettuce compared to, how, you know, how else? You know, there, there may be growers in the room who knows that, hey, the secret of, you know, good produce is the, what, healthy soil. So what kind of soil did the food come from, right? How should the food be prepared? I mean, you can get the best food from the best soil, et cetera, but then by the time it gets to your mouth, it's been chemicalized and microwaved and battered and fried and beat up and cussed out. <clears throat> and you put it in your mouth, it's bad stuff. And so our vision is to develop nutritional interventional processes with scientific validation that will contribute to a greater understanding of this area. In other words, we want to just show the evidence that you have to have a defined plant-based diet that is it's not about if it was vegan, not vegan, veg, not this, that, and the other. But what happens to the food? How's the food prepared? What's in the food? Et cetera, et cetera. That's what's going to make the difference. And when the chips are down, that's going to make all the difference in the world, just in the case of these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Do we have time for Q&A, or I don't know where I go from here.
All right, I'll take Q&A. Nobody said otherwise. Where are the microphones? The microphones are gone. Oh, behind me. Oh. I'll let you can keep the time. Draw this one here. Thank you, sir. Did we have a question up there? Any questions on this side? Dr. Montgomery, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I have a question. So how did um, the patients end up to, what happened for them to end up to where they ended up? Like, you know, like- At the point of going to the hospital? Yes. Yeah, so it, you know, it's a great question because, so the question, these patients, how do they end up where they are? And, and that question can be applied broadly because what happens is that if you have a chronic illness, it's like being on a, a, a slippery slope or you're on a balance beam and the wind blows a little bit this way, a little bit blows that way. So if you're on the slippery slope and this is, you know, to your peril and this is the safety, wind blows this way, you start slipping then. And one thing is it becomes a domino effect. And so we did not push these patients far enough from safety. So you know, if I'm walking, I've got this much latitude, so I can kind of go this way and I got a lot of latitude. But if I got in a narrow walk, you know, then I don't have much latitude. So many patients in these chronic illnesses, and these are people who walk around looking great, feeling great. He said, well, they were looking great the other day, and the next day, the day they're dead. It's like, because they're walking a tightrope, they may not know it, but they get a wind the wrong way, get a little infection, get a little this, get a little that, you know, eat a piece of chicken. But, you know, after the holiday season, the number one day for dying from heart attacks is Christmas Day, or around thereabouts. Because the holiday season, you eat all these rich foods. And, and these bad foods, it's like a toxic wind. You already got your heart's teetering, the kidneys are teetering, the lungs are teetering, eat a chicken leg, a rib, an oxtail, or something, boof. And so it's, it, we don't always know, but it's just something that throws them off balance. And, and that's what we see. There's a hand behind you. Your second question right here. Oh, uh, over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Still about, no worries about it. Um, oh, all right, thank you. Um, my impression of your um, presentation was that, you know, outside of someone coming in, you know, bleeding out and but still potentially about to die, this procedure can outright prevent them from dying immediately and even start to reverse some of their issues. How is this not the first thing that most doctors are doing versus just simply sending people to surgery? And then the second question is, how have you not been assassinated by the pharmaceutical injury? Yeah, 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 yeah. The answer to the second is by the grace of God. The answer to the first is a little bit long-winded, but a little bit longer and more complex. But, but there's a simple answer to the first question. So the first question is, why don't doctors think of this first? Well, one thing, you know, we don't know about this. And this is something, you know, I... I've been eating a vegan lifestyle for 18 years, involving when I got into it, did a juice feast, and I started doing this with my patients, and I saw these amazing changes, and I said, well, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and uh, we worked hard to create a practical implementation in our practice. The issue in medicine is that we're not educated. Doctors are not educated. We're not educated, and we're not trained. We're indoctrinated. Uh, and so that's the lower that, I mean, you know, a trained person can sometimes think a little bit outside of their training, indoctrinated your program. And we, it's a, it's a sad thing because that's it's a part of my profession. My colleagues are all, you know, well meaning uh, and everybody's doing the best to take care of their patients. But unfortunately, we're in a system where at one level we're forced to do these things. I was sharing with someone earlier that the, the pharmaceutical and device industry control our industry because they control the marketing, the money. Uh, I mean, you go like a conference like this at a medical conference, like we, this is a conference we're having here. Medical conference, you see the booths you have out there? The, the drug industry have a booth the size of this whole building. They pay one, one industry for a million dollars for a weekend, for four days. And this is over a million dollars here. Then they control all of our, what, research journals. Put up a journal, American called Jack Journal, or American or Circulation Journal, American Heart Association. Flip through there and see the advertising. Drug company A, drug company B, they control that. Then when they want to get their drugs marketed in prominent journals, New England Journal, 
they paid them off. Okay? So it's all control, and not to mention the FDA's budget's controlled by Big Pharma and Big Device. And so when there's an indication for a heart failure management, the indication is described by the Heart Association, Journal of Medical and Cardiology, and similarly other uh, uh, specialties, they have, you know, standard of care, guidelines. So I have a guideline, you need to use drug A, B, and C. Well, drug A, B, and C came from Big Pharma, the studies they pay for, they sponsor, they manipulate it. When they do the research, they control the data, they control the uh, manipulation of science, the writing, and they pay off some prominent uh, physicians and universities to put their name on it. So that's why we only think of that because we're indoctrinated and to some extent you try to do something differently. So that's why I have to be very careful with my patient. When I'm detoxing, weaning them off medications, we see patients, we, you see me getting labs weekly and monthly. We see them in the office on a regular basis because we want to be very careful, monitor them very carefully, and we wean them only if they're very compliant. That's why we have a restaurant, provide the food, everything. So if you're very compliant, you get a patient's compliant, and they do well, it goes well. The patient is non-compliant, you, know, you wean them off the medication, show up in the emergency room, oh, Dr. Montgomery, stop my beta blocker. Well, what's he doing that for? Well, I didn't tell you to eat fried chicken either, but, you know, but they don't look at that. But, but it's a great question. It's a problem we're dealing with. Yes. Dr. Montgomery, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. So with the patients that you were speaking about today, it was this balance of the American diet culminating in these situations where they were seriously ill. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you stepped in and through nutrition, through plant-based diet, through pretty much super nutrition, were able to get them back to a place of health. Mm -hmm. So you use the word detox a lot in that. And I feel like that's a word that we hear in a lot of different settings, like, you know, commercials on, on TV, here's a detox tea, here's a detox gummy for you to eat. You know, it has a lot of different marketing. So could you speak to the difference between some of those advertised things versus the nutrition that you did with those patients and what we should be doing going home today? Thank you very much for that question. In fact, it's an excellent question. And uh, I did throw that term out a lot and, and uh, I should have explained it. Detox, in my opinion, the first step of detox is to not tox, okay? So the whole thing is first do no harm. So the first step in detox is not tox. You know, the, the, the worst eater in the world, the, the junkiest junk food eater on the planet Earth, every now and then probably allows a piece of broccoli or kale to pass their lips, okay? So getting healthy food in usually is not the problem. The problem is keeping the unhealthy food out in the absolute sense. And so the first step in detox is to not tox. And so when we say detox, we say, okay, now this, that, the other, no chicken, no fish, no beef, no turkey, no worms, no rats, no roaches, no process this, cooks, cook that, microwave the other, blah, 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 blah. And then I add not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb. Okay, very important three words. Now I learned that the hard way because when I started detoxing patients, they would do well. And I remember one patient in particular, he was doing well with bad heart disease, and one day I got a call, he was rushed to the hospital, he was intubated in the CCU. And he was in critical illness, we got him turned around, et cetera, and he was doing well, and I didn't know what happened, and I was talking to him, and you know, sometimes I feel bad asking about the diet, especially if he was you know, just recovering from, but I had to ask, I said, well, how's the diet? kind of asked sheepishly, right? And he says, he put his head down, said had a you know, few spoons of soup, oyster soup. And just a few spoons of oyster soup got him from his living room to ICU in about 36, 48 hours, intubated. I've had other examples of patient dying. Not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb, especially this ill. And so, the point of detoxing, the most important part of detoxing, is to not tox. Why? Fasting in and of itself, water fasting in and of itself, is the most aggressive detox. In fact, your body's designed to detox because the most common symptom of illness is anorexia, i.e. loss of appetite. When you get sick with the flu, lose your appetite. Heart failure, lose your appetite. 
When we get sick, the body is programmed to stop eating. The body is programmed to detox, to not tox. Don't put anything in. And guess what? Dogs, okay? Natural carnivores, when they get sick, grass and water. They stop eating their natural food, so-called, and go to their, what, supernatural food, grass and water. So detox is to not tox. And then you put in the supernatural foods, grass and water, which, you know, we have elaborate forms of that. So I'm glad you asked the question because, yes, there's a lot of stuff out on the market, detox teas and this, that, and the other. And there are a lot of herbal superfoods that are great for you. I'm not saying they're not. But the foundation, the foundation is to remove every bite, drop, and crumb of toxins from your mouth don't look at it, don't touch it, don't think about it, don't smell it, don't sniff it, don't talk about it. And only eat the most natural superfoods that you can. And that brings about these kinds, because then the body goes into gear of healing itself. Great question. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to know, what are some of the ingredients in these miracle smoothies you were talking about earlier? <laughs> There were two things. There's not so so that we use the blue green algae. Uh, you know, there are other herbs you can use. There's like things like sea moss. We use uh, ether lab blue green algae. You can spirulina, moringa, those types of superfoods. You get good quality forms of them. Uh, you can add those to blend it. You know, organic, sustainable kale, spinach, uh, those types of things. We might add some berries to it to, to help smooth the taste out a little bit. But it's just as simple as that. I had my one patient, he was on coconut water, fresh coconut water. We had a super powder, green powder to it. Uh, and he drank that. That was the one with the kidney failure, the, the amyloidosis. So uh, adding these superfoods, it just makes a difference. It just turns the clock. And, and we don't just wait to you this level. We detox all of our patients at this level. You come in and you feeling good and everything, we put it on your raw detox because it has amazing effects on people who are not this sick because it helps turn your taste buds around in a rapid fashion, and it helps us get patients off medication more rapidly. And the other thing about it, it has a, bit, a, a, a powerful psychological effect because when you start getting these benefits early on and the rapid effects, then it helps you sustain it longer. So, so that's, that's part of the benefit. Anyway. So that's gonna have to be the last question. I'm so sorry. But um, let's thank Dr. Montgomery for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, please do go to the last slide, and um, um, you'll see his information. Yeah, I take a picture the last of that. Slide. Yep. And um, be in touch with him. He has a lot of programs that you can do right here from where you are, and he can take care, good care of you. So yeah, we do remote doing. counseling. We have a community that you can join remotely that gives you support. Anybody that's looking for support, um, we do the uh, uh, online coaching. Uh, myself and my team helping you with detox and things like that. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of benefits there. So uh, you're welcome to fly to Houston from a clinical standpoint, but you don't have to. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't do on time. No, you did good. You, you saw it in the, in the pocket. It doesn't check and see if you have Oh, good. Great. No problem. So we're going to just take about two or three minutes, let you um, take some time to stretch and do the things you need to do for about five minutes, and we'll have Miyoko Shinner on virtually, and we're going to get her pulled in. She's in? Okay, so give us two or three minutes, and we'll be right with you. We'll introduce um, Ms. Shinner. Mrs. Shinner, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
So again, just one or two minutes, and we'll have um, Miss Shinner on, and we're excited to have her as a part of this event, and she's in our finale. We're excited. That's only Milton is that loud. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Tone, see if there's anybody um, up, down, around the door areas and see if we can bring her, bring her in. I'm going to do her introduction. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I said one or two minutes, two or three. I'm just anxious because Miyoko's in the house, and I want to make sure we honor her time and that we're excited that she's joined us in California. She's very busy and she's always doing for the vegan community. And what I want to do is introduce her to you for those who do not know her and let her talk to you about the ethical and um, environmental impacts of her vegan brand and her story. And then she'll be able to answer any questions for you, I think. So let me tell you a little about Ms. Jenner. Recognized by the United Nations as a vegan revolutionary and it's the Future of Women Global Initiative, and named one of Forbes 50 over 50, Miyoko Shinner, founder and, and CEO of Miyoko's Creamery, is an Epicurean activist who is, a leading, who is leading the creation of animal-free plant dairy food system. She's actually doing more than that, but I'm going by her bio. Um, the, through an innovative proprietary process that merges culinary arts and food science, Shinner has cracked the code in making fermented cheese and cultured butter from plants plant milks that rival animal dairy counterparts on compassion, taste, and nutrition on a world scale. Miyoko's creamy products can be found at over 30,000 stores in the United States and Canada and are distributed as well in South Africa, Hong Kong, and Singapore. The pioneer of the plant dairy cheese revolution, Shinner is a passionate culinarian, former restaurateur, TV personality, and she's still also a Facebook personality, guys. She's on social media. She does a show every week. Um, I, I added in an ad lib. Um, TV personality and best-selling cook author, cook, cookbook author. Um, Shinner has dedicated her life to inspiring compassion through the joy of food and the positivity plants and the positivity plants. And is the co-founder of Rancho Compassion, a farmed animal sanctuary in California that provides homes to over 120 rescued f animals. Uh, Shinner has been featured in Bloomberg, Forbes, The New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Huff Post, Food and Wine, and many more, including the Ed Summit. So join me in welcoming Miyoko Shinner. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, Greenville. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not there. I can hear Milton laughing in the background. <laughs> Um, which is uh, which makes me want to be there even more. Hello, Milton. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I wish I could be there with you, but um, I have to be somewhere else tonight as well too. So thank you so much for the warm introduction. What I want to do is I'm not going to be talking about health. I think you've heard a lot about that. Uh, and if you're not vegan, you've heard from Milton, you've heard from Dr. Baxter. You know that that's the thing to do. What I want to really talk about today 
is the ethical and the environmental aspects of veganism. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. Um, are you, oh, uh, okay, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is it possible for me to, to share my screen? I, did, I didn't know I couldn't do that. Otherwise, I'll just I'll just start talking. But um, I did have a I did have a, a presentation. So Miyoko, they're working on it. They're up there at the booth working on it. Give just one moment. Is okay, it done? Sure. Is it done? It's done. You're in it. You can do it now. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start here. Uh, slideshow. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, meet Angel. She is one of the rescued dairy cows that lives her life, her good life at Rancho Compasión. And I am an ethical vegan. I choose to live my life with compassion. And this is something that I want to talk about. And why compassion is the root of everything. Not only in terms of the heart, but in saving the planet, in saving animals, and in saving saving your own health. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, as a consumer brand, one of the things that I've had to think about very hard is, what are the, all the things that I should consider as I create new products? And as we create a new food system, because that's where we are today, we recognize that we cannot continue to eat the types of foods we've been eating that come from industrialized animal agriculture, and we must pave a new path for a more sustainable food system. But what are all the issues that we should consider? Is it just that we substitute a plant-based burger for an animal burger? Is that all we need to do? What is it we have to consider? And this is really what I thought about is I began to think about all the different kinds of products that are coming out and all the money that's going into this. And sometimes the money comes from the same players behind animal agriculture, such as Tyson or Smithfields, I began to think about food is so much more than just our own health or that of the environment or even that of the animals. Food also impacts justice, equity, and liberty of humans as well. So as I began to think about it, I realized that we must create a food system that honors not only the planet, but animals. Sorry. And the reason we need to protect animals is that in order to create a just and fa uh, safe food system, we can't destroy ecosystems. So what we're doing right now is destroying ecosystems in which wildlife lives in order to create grazing land for cattle, for example. And so we are destroying the rights of living beings in these ecosystems, as well as the rights of the farmed animals that we create and supplant in those areas. And by doing that, we harm ourselves. So when we think about the food system of tomorrow, we have to think about what are the foods that are going to create justice? For example, economic, reduce economic disparity as well. Um, if, for example, we create a cell-based meat system that re requires bioreactors to produce, we're going to use billions and billions of dollars to do that. We'll remove animals from the equation. We'll be making food in bioreactors. But who will be funding those bioreactors? Who will be the people that are working in them? We will be maintaining the same economic disparities we, we currently have with the haves and the have-nots. So for me, creating a plant-based food system that creates justice, equity, and liberty for everyone across the spectrum, consumers to the producers, creating urban gardens, creating opportunities for people in any area is absolutely critical. And when we do this and we create smaller economic uh, decentralized food systems, we will be able to liberate the planet because we won't be destroying it. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the very beginning. When I was in, in college, I was a huge cheese aficionado. I wasn't a vegan yet. And all I really wanted was a great cheese platter. You could count on me every Friday night to be 
uh, in my dorm room with a platter of cheese and wine, and anyone was able to come in and nosh on cheese. That is all I ever wanted. I thought the good life was about having cheese and wine. I mean, who could ask for anything more? Now, this is actually a cheese platter featuring our cheeses at one of the wineries in Napa County, where um, our cheeses are on the boards of all of these wineries and high-end restaurants now. So vegan products are making their way into hospitality, white tablecloth restaurants. Um, it's super, super exciting. So these are just some of our products, but this is for me what food is all about. Food is about heart. Food is about bringing people around the table, whether it's beer or wine or kombucha or just a glass of water. It's about bringing people around the table to share stories, to share their woes, to share their how their day went, to bring people together and form community. And food must have that kind of power. That's another one of those things that I'm thinking about. We're moving into this era of food where everything is instant and we consume these foods in front of our computer rather than creating bountiful dishes that will bring people around the table. I truly believe that if humanity is going to survive, we must bring people around the table with delicious food. And occasionally pizza. That was another thing that I had a hard time giving up. So. I went vegan in the 1980s, and after many, many years, I decided that I needed to create foods that I missed. So back in the 1990s, I started my first business, which was making meat alternatives, and this is one of the products that I had. I also had the first non-dairy whip topping called Hip Whip, um, and uh, the tagline was, it's cooler than cool. I also made the unribs and the unstakeout, uh, and I really didn't know why I was doing all of this, but I knew that as a vegan, the, I couldn't talk about veganism. I couldn't, you know, protest or carry a, a placard and say, you know, animals are my friends, not food, etc. I couldn't do that. The only way I could talk about veganism and why I ate this way was by creating food and bringing people around the table and getting people to, to enjoy what the bounty of what I was able to prepare. And I finally, and I wrote books as well too. So these are some of the books that I've written. And then in 2014, I started this vegan cheese company. I started with four employees. Today we have about 150. It was very, very hands-on. It's much more automated. But from the very beginning, our foods are highly unprocessed, meaning that we make cheese the old fashioned way uh, starting with plant milk, a, a nutritious plant milk that's unadulterated, very few ingredients. We inoculate it with traditional cultures using natural fermentation and aging. We transform plant milk into cheese and butter. So what we are trying to do is reinvent 2,000 years of cheese making history in just a decade and really, really understand how do these plant milks behave and how can we create the most nutritious plant milks possible. So this is sort of history in the making. Cheese was invented about 10,000 years ago, and we think two, in the 2000s, the plant milk, cheese, and butter revolution has begun. We're doing it the same way. We're not making it from oil and starch. We're not making it in the laboratory. We're making it in the old fashioned way, and we can transform plant milk into cheese and butter. That's absolutely lovely. I want to tell you a little bit about why we exist. Our why is to inspire a deeper and actionable love of all animals, of all living beings, and to accord them the right to occupy a place on this planet. The way we do that is our how, or our mission, and that is to perfect the art of making dairy products from plant milks. And then we strive to become, our goal is to become the world's finest, source of plant milk, cheese, and butter. And I realized all along, while I was making all of this food uh, and bringing people around the table, I wasn't just doing it because I liked food or I liked cooking or I wanted to sell products. I, I realized that this was my form of being an activist, just like Dr. Milton Mills and Dr. Baxter go, go out and speak about health. That is their form of activism for me making delicious natural organic foods is my form of activism and giving it to the world bringing people around my table this is how i preach sustainability 
animal rights and liberty and justice for all. So I want to get into the environmental aspect a little bit. We're going to play a little numbers game. So 60%, anyone know what the 60% represents? I can't see you, unfortunately, and it's a little strange talking to a screen and not being able to see people. But does anyone know what this stands for? OK, that's the global species extinction rate since 1970 due to animal agriculture. Because of animal agriculture, we have decimated, we have completely wiped out 60% of all species on this planet. This is the highest number of and the fastest rate of species extinction ever in the history of, this, of, of humankind. Um, 100, 100 million, does anyone know what 100 million represents? OK, that's how many cows, how many cows there are in the United States. There is almost one third cattle for every man, woman, and child. And that's not it. That's not all, because we're still importing cows. We're still importing beef from Brazil and uh, the Amazon, as well as China and other places. So there, we're probably, every, the average American eats something like 228 pounds of meat on an annual basis. And so we are eating a lot of meat. 40%, anyone know what that is? OK, so that's the amount of land mass occupied globally by the livestock industry in the, United, uh, in the United States. It's even higher. It's closer to 50%. And this is not just the land that's occupied by livestock. It's also the land that we grow crops on to feed that livestock. Now, what's sort of interesting is that uh, there was a study done, and they found that if we were to just grow crops directly to feed humans, we would only need the amount of land occupied by Indiana, Illinois, and half of Iowa. That is not much land at all. And we could rewild all the rest of that land, grow forests again, uh, have a wildlife ecosystem start to thrive again. Those forests would become huge carbon sinks. We could start cut, uh, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, and we could start to heal the planet. So this is really, really frightening when you think about, you know, what is the environmental impact of that hamburger I had? It occupied a lot of land. So 2050, anyone know what that one is? I can barely hear, but there's a lot. I mean, basically, if we don't do something by 2050, uh, there's really very little opportunity to survive on this planet. But this is when oceans are going to, going to collapse, too. If you haven't seen Sea Spiracy, you should see that. But there will be no more fish left in the sea. So I always tell people, you know, if you're trying to cut out, I mean, even if you don't want to cut out fish by 2050, you're going to have to because there won't be any left. So 75%, anyone know what this number is? All right, this is the global deforestation caused by animal agriculture. We are not going to have an Amazon anymore within a few years because we are burning it down to the ground to create cattle grazing land. So this is extremely frightening. 70, uh, that deforestation is one of the leading causes of climate change because we're, they are huge carbon sinks and we are losing them. So at this point, 91% of the Amazon has been of 91% of Amazon deforestation has been due to animal agriculture, according to the World Bank. So if we were to stop animal agriculture, we could start to regrow the Amazon and reverse climate change. So we can't have a Green New Deal without a Green New Meal. Remember that, because that's a handy little expression. But I want to tell you a little bit about our products. Um, our products that you have seen so far um, have been primarily made out of cashew seeds that are farmed. Actually, they're not farmed. They're a wild crop that grows in Vietnam, and they, uh, they cover vast mountaintops. I've been there, seen them with my eyes. And because they're a wild crop, there is no irrigation whatsoever. Only rainfall feeds them. And if you just look at the chart on the right, on one acre of land, there's about 80 cashew trees that live for about 50 years each. An acre of land 
will produce about 2,300 pounds of cashews. That will produce 6,000 pounds of our cheese. Whereas on an acre of land, you can only grow about one seventh of a cow or sometimes even less, depending on whether there are drought conditions or if you're in the West. A seventh of a, a one acre will support uh, a, a cow will occupy about seven acres if you're in the lush uh, grass lands of, let's say, South Carolina. But if you're in California, where it's it's uh, there's a drought half of the year, then you need 10 to 12 acres for one cow to survive. And on that one acre of land, you can only make about 200 gallons of milk that will only produce 182 pounds of dairy cheese. So if you just think about that in terms of land use, and water use, you can see how much more sustainable a, a cheese that's made of cashew milk can be. Now, we're not just using cashew milk. We have new milks that we are exploring that use oats, legumes, and we have a really exciting one that uses watermelon seeds. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But turns out watermelon seeds are among the most nutritious uh, plants on this planet. So anyway, so we were talking about pizza. Sometimes um, I need pizza. But now we have a liquid mozzarella. This is available in the store. You pour it on and you bake it. But we have a new kind of liquid mozzarella for food service that's out of made out of the watermelon seeds that I was telling you about. Watermelon seeds, calorie for calorie, have more protein than cow's milk. And it performs like cow's milk in that it coagulates and gets nice and firm. It actually forms curds like cow's milk. So this is sort of our new discovery, and we are so excited about all the cheeses that we're going to be creating with cow's milk, including a cottage cheese that we're going to be rolling out uh, in January of 2023 that has six ingredients, very, very clean. It's like water, uh, salt, cottage cheese, um, watermelon seeds, sunflower seeds, cultures. Um, and it has 10 grams of protein per serving. So um, we're super excited about this novel new ingredient. When you think about the millions of different types of plants there are that we have not even looked at in a non-traditional way, you can imagine all the possibilities there are for exploration. Um, we have only begun to explore that in the last uh, 10 years or so in terms of turning these plant milks into cheeses and butters and traditional dairy products that we like. But there are so many new opportunities. So let's talk about the ethical impacts of plant-based brands for a minute. Everyone's heard the expression, happiness is a fundamental human right. I would wager that it is a fundamental right for not only humans, but for all living species on this planet. And here's Angel again. And uh, as you can see, even they like to be cuddled. I'm going back to Erica, this cow here, who was an arthritic dairy cow who arrived at Rancho Compassion. Uh, she was going to be killed because um, she was arthritic and couldn't stand for milking. So before they impregnated her, they were going to kill her. And someone managed to rescue her, and she came to Rancho Compassion, and for some reason there's an energy at a sanctuary that animals understand. And as soon as the trailer doors opened, she ran off into the fields, and this arthritic cow, who later succumbed to arthritis and passed away for several years, did nothing but run at full tilt like this. She was not unable to stand for milking. She was having a sit-down protest. At the, at the dairy because she did not want to suffer that. And when she came to Rancho Compassion, this is what she did. She ran all the time, full of joy, because she was finally accorded the right to pursuit of happiness. And all animals should have the same right. So a brand, I asked, what should brands consider as we create a new food system? For me, a brand should consider not only the health impacts of their food or the environmental impacts of their food, but the ethical impacts of their food and question, what is it we're really trying to do? And I believe that what we're trying to do is evolve human beings. Veganism is about the evolution of the human being 
to becoming a humane being. This is our evolution. Veganism is our evolution, the evolution of humankind to becoming humane kind beings. This is, and when you give the opportunity for animals to live their lives the way they want, they begin to express themselves in these fundamental ways that would absolutely shock you. So I want you to see Angel again, and I want you to meet Echo, the goose, who is Angel's best friend. In fact, Echo the goose thinks he is Angel's royal guardsman, and he protects Angel, walks around Angel all day long, and if you're a stranger and you try to go up to Angel, Echo will come at you with his neck stretched out like this and chase you away. The bond between the, these two is unbreakable, and they found each other at an animal sanctuary. They would never have found themselves, found each other at a farm. Echo would have been a goose for foie gras, having food shoved down his throat so they could enlarge his liver and then eat him, and Angel would have been milked and then slaughtered at the age of four or five. But here at Rancho Compasión, they were able to find each other. This, I believe, is the purpose of a vegan, a truly vegan company, one that exists not only to sell products, but to create a positive future for all. These are just some more of the, the happy critters at Rancho Compasión. It's hard for me to give a talk without sharing animal pictures. Okay, I wanna tell you, I know I have to wrap this up, so I'm gonna tell you one more story. We also have heart for farmers. Um, a lot has changed in the world of farming since the industrialized agriculture has taken over. So we created a program called Dairy Farm Transition. I'm gonna just share a few facts. According to the USDA, dairy farmers are now losing money because of, of, uh, these cons of consolidation. And the average dairy farmer is actually going to have a net income of minus $1,840. There is a huge prevalence of depressive symptoms among U.S. dairy farmers, and the suicide rate is extremely high, far higher than the public. And dairy farmers are faced with, I mean, we've talked to a lot of dairy farmers. They are facing declining milk prices, uh, narrow processing contracts, uh, regulations, climate change pressures, and increasingly low consumer demand. And so, we are often at Miyoko seen as a threat to the dairy industry. And we thought, how can we actually change this perception? How can we actually help a dairy farmer stay on his land, but not farming? How can we save those cows, move them to a sanctuary and help the farmer stay on his land? So we created something called the Dairy Farm Transition Program at Miyoko's, where we are helping farmers uh, go from crops to cows. Our program is called DFT. Uh, that's our website, dairyfarmtransition.com. And what we're doing is we are providing economic assistance to a dairy farmer to help them through the transition. We're training them on regenerative agriculture so we can rebuild the soil. We're uh, offering to buy what he grows or what he or she grows. And uh, it's going to be oats and sunflowers. Um, we're partnering with Rodale Institute and kitchen table consultants to help them with an economic analysis of their farming crops, and we're providing them with business coaching. We also partnered with Mercy for Animals and Animal Outlook to create the Farmer's Toolkit, which is online. You can go there as a farmer and find all the tools to help transition. So if you know a dairy farmer in your area or a pig farmer or a chicken farmer, and they're struggling, as so many are, please encourage them to go to the Farmer Toolkit where they can find resources that will help them transition to a more sustainable, compassionate form of farming. At Miyoko's, we're out to inspire a food culture that savors compassion. We wanna to touch hearts, delight taste buds, unite food lovers, change the food system, and thereby change the world, and together we can do that. This is what we're doing. We're just creating a simple, clean way of making cheese and butter, changing how we make cheese, 
and changing hearts in the process. Thank you. And I think we have, I don't know, do we have time for a few questions or? Absolutely, I, okay. absolutely. Thank you so much, Miyoko. I didn't even know about the other programs you had. I feel like I didn't do enough research. Uh, but um, everyone is just so pleased and they were that all the things you're doing. We have a couple of farmers here. They're not um, dairy farmers, but I wonder if you work with um, other farmers too uh, that aren't uh, dairy. Right now, yeah, our, our goal is really just to help transition those involved in animal agriculture. Uh, so that's, that's what we're working on right now. Okay. We want them to participate in, in the future of food. We want them to be our partners. I got so this you. is really what compassion is about. It's for it's for everybody. It's not just you know the straight and narrow uh, vegan route where we ostracize others. Well, I appreciate. It. Anybody have any questions for Omiyoko? We have one question coming up. Yeah. Oh, Mike next. We're gonna um, have Shonda first. <laughs> Hi, Miyoko. This is Shonda. I just want to tell you that as a human being. I see you now on a higher level for choosing to reach out and show, truly show what compassion is because you did not have to do for the animal farmers what you did. So your level of compassion is setting the, um, the level or raising the bar for all of us if we're going to claim to be vegans to show compassion and to put action behind of it. So congratulations. That was a comment more so. Do you have any other questions for Miyoko about where to get her products? So we're in Greenville, South Carolina, Miyoko. Where um, you're in Sprouts? Are you any? What other? Um, you're in so many. You're in stores across the country, but um, what yeah, is the best we're, way? Yeah, we're in Sprouts, Publix, uh, Whole Foods, um, uh, mm -hmm. I, H E B. I, I don't know what uh, what all you have down there, but uh, we're in. You know, we're in thirty thousand stores, so there's there's going to be. Uh, a product near you. You can always go to our website, miyokos.com, and there's a store locator there. Excellent, excellent. Anybody else? Maybe have a question behind me? Okay, hold on. Oh, I can make it up the stairs. Here we go. <laughs> how do you start, you know, in your backyard? You know, how do you, I, I know a lot of people are interested in gardening and, you know, starting to um, set up, I, I actually built a garden box, but I just have plants, but I like to, you know, grow tomatoes and vegetables. So what's the best way or resources to start doing that? You mean to learn about how to grow vegetables? Yeah. Yes. Is that, is that your question? Yes. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resources. Even the farmer toolkit will tell you about that. There are so many uh, sites online you can find on growing vegetables. Um, but, you know, it's what you do with the vegetables afterwards. And what people often find is that they grow much more than they can eat. And I really encourage here, I have a, a garden here. Um, I just let uh, all the volunteers and staff from the sanctuary just come and pick whatever vegetables they want. So I sort of envision this food system where people have gardens and they put out their excess veggies on the street on a table for people mm -hmm. to take um, or invite others to come in and pick or farm if you have land um, that you can share with others uh, to create your own community garden right in your own yard. Um, and you might find if you do that, that there's, uh, there's a, a gardener or a farmer down the street that knows more than you and come, can come and help you. That's beautiful. Hold on, we have one more. Thank you so much for that answer. Hold on. Hi, Miyoka. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, I feel like in a lot of these issues that we're facing and the statistics about deforestation, about loss of species, about these very almost seemingly insurmountable problems, sometimes the perspective of hopelessness comes up or how do we even tackle this? And so I was curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, when people say, oh, there's no hope, there's no point in trying. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's very, very easy to lose hope. In fact, there's a study that shows that uh, suicides and depression are actually rampant among Gen Zers who are being left with the problems that we have created, our generations have created. And they're becoming extremely depressed and feeling a sense of hopelessness. Uh, 
I am an optimist. Even in the darkest moments, I realize that I have to live as if there is hope. That's right. And that is the only thing we can do. We have, we have, we have to change ourselves. Ultimately, we may not be able to change the world, but we can change ourselves, and that's all we have in the end. So we have to do the best we can do, regardless of what the consequences look like.、Mm -hmm. They may not seem hopeful, but we, as an individual, as individuals, will be completely hopeless if we don't work on ourselves. At the end of the day, it's what we do. What responsibility we take for ourselves that will matter. Great, that's wonderful. We have one more question for you, Miyoko. I want some more question. And thank you so much. That was very insightful. Oh, we have two more questions. Milton has a question. Miyoko. Milton has a question. Hold on. We have one more. Then we'll have Milton. We'll have Milton wrap it up. Hold on. Yes, Miyoko. This is Michael Brown. I'm a farmer as well in this area. The question I have for you, based upon the circles that you operate, obviously with your business, it is a very different business model. But you do come in contact with other business owners、uh, and people that have extreme opportunities to change the lives and change the landscape of the, the environments that you operate in. Like my good friend Cat Taylor in your state, what direct impacts and conversations do you have with others that will have the opportunity to make the kind of inroads that you're you're seeking from your business? To impact、uh, what we're doing in terms of changing the, the, the food landscape, you know, I encourage everyone to get into food in some way, or or get into a business in some way.、It、doesn't matter how big or small it is. The very first business I had、uh, was making vegan pound cakes and delivering them by backpack by subway in Tokyo. That was that was a tiny, tiny business, but those pound cakes meant something to somebody. And it was my way of getting started. You know, whether it's just a little—it's、uh, a community-supported agriculture that you start, or a little business where you're making、uh, bean burgers that you're selling at the farmers market. We need more businesses. We need more opportunities for people to take control of their own economics and to share that wealth with everybody else. We need more. Options in the world for eating healthfully, sustainably, and compassionately. So I encourage. I, I mentor a lot of small businesses. I mentor a lot of,、um, especially female entrepreneurs. I'm really passionate about helping women.、Um, but I, I just encourage everyone to keep trying. It's not easy. Businesses aren't easy, and you're going to have a lot of. It's a lot of hard work, and sometimes things don't go well. I have failed so many times in my life. I can't even begin to tell you, but. I've learned through everything I've ever done, and at this point, we're at a critical point in human history where we have to change the world, and so we all have to try. And if your way of trying and your form of activism is having a business, then that is something that you need to do.、Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, I mean, of course, this is Milton. I, what I have is not so much a question as I, I just wanted to say two things. One, you said.、Uh, You may not change the world, and、um, I'm like, are you kidding? The world is such a different place for all the things that you've done.、Um, and I wanted to also say that this was absolutely one of the most inspirational talks I've I've heard in years.、Um, oh, Milton! I just wish I now, could be with you and give you a big bear hug.、Um, I, I miss yeah, you. No, thank you so much. I. The, your your vision、um, and your the the ways in which you've you've come up the, you've、uh, dreamed up to to intervene and to、uh, are so innovative and、um, it's just amazing. Wow! I mean, this is the perfect coda to this conference. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you do. And there's no question you you are helping to change the world. The world is a different place.、Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miyoko. We all enjoyed you. Thank you so much. Is this thing on? Yes, it is. So I want to thank you all for staying. This has been a long day, and it's been a good day. And I want to thank you,、uh, Tone and I. Come on up, Tone.
And I'm going to pass this to Tone after I finish. It's been a wonderful day. We've had a, everything from ethics to clinical to culinary to demos to great vendors. And everyone had very positive things. Vendors were helping vendors. There was no competition here. There's no competition in this room. It's all about learning. So let's encourage more of these relationships. We've had representatives from the House of Representatives. We have doctors. We have, we have, what, we have world changers in here, and every one of you are one of them. So I'm going to thank you for being here and taking a part of it. This is from Tony. That's from me. I don't have much to say, but I just want to say thank you to Dawn one more time. We can give it up for Dawn one more time. Thank you so much for putting this together. This has just, a, this has been amazing. The information I've learned and the information everybody's learned today. And you know, I'm a, a type 2 diabetic, and I, I'm, I'm going, just going to go ahead and say it right now. When we do this thing next year, I will not be a diabetic next year, okay? I will not be a diabetic next year. Thank you all so much for coming on out. You'll have a great one. Thank you. Thank you so much.